meeting will be recorded and if you don't want to be on the recording you need to turn your video off and mute um, or you can leave the meeting but it will be recorded because we want to keep it for public um, purposes after this. Um, and I'd like to welcome Gail Pringle, who is a new member of the committee. Gail, do you just want to switch your video on for a minute so we can see you for 30 seconds? I'll put your, you've got your hand up as well, Gail. So do you want to say something? Um, I've just unmuted myself and I think my video is on. Can everybody see yes, me? Yes, we can. OK, so um, I've actually gone and got dressed. So hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm out of loungewear and I'm, I'm now looking a little bit more official. Hello, everybody, and uh, uh, thank you for welcoming me to the meeting. Welcome. Stephen, did you have your hand up? Sorry, that was from earlier. OK, put your hands down, please, if you've spoken. <laughs> Gail, put your hand down. <laughs> Could I say a word? Yes, please, Can, Willie. I'm, I'm going to say very little in the meeting. Uh, I was due to come to your meeting in March. It was mm. going to be my last meeting as PCC. Oh, that, right. events, that events rather took over. Yeah. So I, I, I'm looking forward to to, to to being present while this meeting takes place. But I and obviously I will answer any questions you might have of me. But basically, my role, I think, is to sort of sit and listen. Um, I do have to disappear at four o'clock because I have a, a phone call with the shadow policing minister, which I can't really not go to. Of course. One -on -one. Yeah. I hope that's I hope that won't be considered rude if you're still if you're still debating then thank you so much and thanks for joining us for this for this meeting that's very very kind of you to do that and to take the time to do it Pleasure. um so um shall we get started any other functional questions anybody's got no deep ethical questions at this stage just functional <laughs> okay any apologies Teresa? any apologies I think we had Mark Peel um, sent apologies. Yeah. Just got the apologies from Rob Nixon as well. Sorry, it's Julia. All oh, um, right, okay. So I, I'm I'm here in, on on behalf of Rob PCC. Oh, thing. thank you, Julia. Yeah, I mean, if you you're welcome to switch your video on if you want to. So it's up to you. Um, I'll move on to urgent business. Is there any urgent business? None that we're aware of, Chair. Thank you. Any declarations of interest with regard to any item on the agenda today? No. OK, thank you. I'll move to minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of December and the rolling action sheet. So let's take the minutes first, if I can find them. Um, and does anybody have any points to make on page one? Just see. OK. Page two, any corrections, first of all, I should say. Page three. Page four. Page five. OK. And the rolling action should give us any matters arising. But is there anything else that people wanted to raise? No. OK. So, Angela, I'm going to move to the rolling action sheet. And if you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind just taking us through that. Well, I will as soon as I get it up, Chair. Sorry. OK, that's fine. Sorry, I had I'll it up a minute ago and for some reason I... have That's so um, annoying, isn't it? <laughs> I know. I know as soon as I did that, I think I realised. Um, <laughs> right, rolling action sheet. Yeah. OK, yeah, I think um, the, all the grey ones are obviously discharged. So... Uh, Minute 31 of 19. Um, I think that's happened now. You agreed to do that. Yes. Um, so that is discharged. 31. Now, 31 of 19 there, we've got a member of the Coercive Powers Group mm. be invited to attend. We haven't got stop and search on the agenda this time. No. So hence that hasn't happened. Um, moving down. A H the HR vision is on your agenda today. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether yourself, Chair. And, OK, so that's Sorry, still outstanding. Still outstanding. Yeah. Um, defer this paper, but I don't know what that the paper will cover the ethical face. Oh, fraud is on the agenda. So yes. 40 of 19 is discharged. Report template. Uh, 40 of 19 again on the report template is discharged. 
Um, yeah. Okay, I think I think we're about there. And people zones will come in six months' time. Um, and I don't know what forty-one of nineteen report to cover the law is not kept up with technology. I think that's is that cybercrime. Um, I can't, can't. It, it could be. Yeah, and and you. Yeah. Have, have a report on cybercrime. So there's quite a few there that have been discharged, Chair, but I'm sure we'll have more to add after today. Okay, thank you. Um, I will move on to the annual report. Oh. <laughs> it's okay, Angela, while, while you're trying to... Yeah, get... I've got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. I'm sorry. I'm, it's just flicking between screens. Do you want me to take this now, Chair? Yes, please. OK, so this is the annual report on the work of the committee. I'll, I'll be fairly brief. Um, as, as members will know that previously the annual report has been produced, which hasn't actually aligned with the commissioner's annual report, and that is based on a financial year. Your annual report, just because of when you were first convened, um, has gone from September to September. So back at your December meeting, you did agree to align it for future. So this report goes a bit longer, doesn't it, than the, the full 12 months but henceforth you will be aligned um, on the financial year so um, it's, it's here for your comments for, for members comments chair um, once the report is agreed and I know that as chair you will do your own forward in the report which we will insert um, we'll then produce a document which will go on the website um, be shared be taken to engagement events and we will arrange for a meeting for yourself with the chief and the commissioner to feedback on the work over the year so the report is at the appendix and it's very much there for members comments uh, for me to take away and, and make any amendments you want. Thank you very much, Angela, for, for putting that report to, together. I will indeed write the foreword um, for it. I might try and contact Killian to see if he wanted to say anything in particular for his um, the six yeah. months that he was chair um, and also just to thank him, which I will do in the foreword. Um, and Additionally, we'd also, I would like the section, the blurb and my photo changing because I've mm -hmm. moved jobs and so does Lynn wants a bit of an update on her, um, right. on her profile as well. Yeah. Um, did anybody have any other comments on the annual report? Linda. Hi, um, yeah, I just, I'd like to second that I'd like to change my blur as well on um, on the report. So can I suggest that we just change it and send it in to Angela for her to upload? Yes, yes please. That yes, will be please. fine. Yeah. Thank you. OK. All right, then. I am going. Don't see any more hands. Uh, Linda, put your hand down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, see any, don't see any more hands on that. So I'm going to move on to the next paper, social media. And while I get that up, Please do come in, committee members. Or do, is there going to be an introduction by any member of the force? Yeah, I think um, if Rick Fitzjulia, sorry, so I put my video on. Um, yeah. You can probably see a child's bedroom in the background. Yes, um, okay. So, um, hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, um, Julia. So, hello. I think, so, so, this is a report um, from Rich Ward, the head of professional standards. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, um, so professional standards. And it's really just outlining, I think, our approach. I mean, I hope, hopefully this is fairly self-explanatory, but it's just outlining our approach to social media. So I think the ethical dilemma, just to bring it into the context of the ethical, um, this committee, is looking at the balance between um, sort of your, your off-duty expectations of off-duty behaviour and expectations of privacy for police officers and police staff um, and obviously the link with public confidence um, and the fact that when police officers and police staff are engaged in activity um, which social media does lend itself to um, that, that can tend to discredit them um, we've obviously had to put, put policies and procedures in place to, to manage and deal with that and, and in all honesty, it's quite a painful journey. It has been a little bit of a painful journey in the past, um, but I think we're now a lot clearer around the way forward. And I think that's how what Rich has tried to articulate in his in his reports and in the force procedures. So, um, I mean, I wasn't going to go through the report page by page. I'm hoping people have had the chance to. You don't need to. Yeah. 
yeah to, to so you'll see i mean just at page eight we've got the um online own it campaign which is probably the main product that's come out um we don't expect officers in all honesty to sit reading loads and loads of policies and procedures but we've got this campaign which really encourages them so it's the sort of stuff that we stick on the back of loo doors because that tends to get quite a lot of purchase but it's this really encouraging people to think what you're doing online and how's that how does that reflect on you and um and i think we have now certainly made that transition culturally in in terms of um in terms of people's expectations and, or people's understanding of what's expected of them so i don't know if there's anything broader you'd like me to say around that um so i'm going to bring lynn in in a minute but thank you so much um julia for for doing that i think it is uh, you know, there's some really good clear stuff in there and i i really like the visuals I, yeah. I wanted to watch the videos, but we didn't have links to them. We received it as an appendix, but we'd be good to watch the videos at another time. Um, Lynn. Yes. Um, I, what, what I wanted to follow up on was um, a discussion that um, the committee had had after seeing um, Operation Olive as part of our dip sampling. And our view was that even in a, a private closed group on social media, if discriminate, discriminatory or offensive language against any of the protected character, characteristics is used, if that comes to light, um, it's very serious in our opinion and uh, a breach of their code of ethics, etc. Um, so we just wanted to, um, to raise that as an issue. And I know that um, all kinds of advice is given and training, but when something comes to light in that way, that needs to be treated in a very serious manner, in our opinion. And I think I think we would. I mean, thank you. And I think we we would completely agree with that. And it is, um, you know, and, and it is, and that and, and some of the some of the um, the campaign that we try try to. I mean, you'd, you'd you'd like to assume people wouldn't say things that were racist and discriminatory, but um, you know, and sometimes um, there's that that, that it can it can go into some of the banter, and, and and I think that's probably a high proportion of what where we have had issues is where there has been what some people would refer to as banter, but this is clearly inappropriate. So I think that's where the focus of a lot of um, our attention has been. But very much agree with your your interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, I think it was, you know, we, we did say in our pre-meeting, Julia, that uh, we thought that police, staff or officers, by virtue of being in the employment of the police force, police service, needed to uphold standards on any public platform, um, which would be, con you know, as the same as if they were uh, at work. Um, it's those standards that we respect because it is a public platform. Of course, you know, if they're at home and they're just talking to people, then people are entitled to their opinions. But it, when it becomes public, then it's something else. So, yeah, we, we welcomed the report and the number of considerations that are in it. Thank you. We did have one minor point, Julia, right at, on B3, uh, page B3, the equality impact assessment. It, it, I think it might have been a question to the author or something. Have these been undertaken if necessary? Um, and we would like to know the answer to that one as well. <laughs> but maybe you don't have the answer right now. No, no, sorry. So what was it? Where was the... So uh, um, on the main paper, the um, paper mark B, on page B3, on implications. So it's got financial implications, legal implications, and then equality impact assessment. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I see. Yeah. Yeah. It's been undertaken if necessary. Yeah. So we would like to see an equality impact assessment or yeah. to know whether one's been done. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Is that OK? Yeah, it is. All right. Thank you. Any yeah. other comments? Anybody? No. OK, so I'm going to move on to crimes against older people which is paper c sorry you're going to get ever so bored with me i'm ever so sorry well, there andy's going to come and do a presentation in a minute <laughs> oh no it's great i love love hearing from you carry on julia <laughs> so, um so this is a paper that um has been prepared by lucy bachelor who's one of our um safeguarding chief inspectors 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And really, the issue here, um, it's quite a, one of the things that she's done is just to, is to update the action plan. So there was an action plan that was a thematic action plan that right. the HMIC had made in terms of um, how police forces deal with people, victims who are who are older. Mm-hmm. Um, so which we feel that we're quite well placed in many areas with some areas for development. Um, but the sort of ethical issue that we wanted to consider here today was um, what how we define older people, because so far we haven't defined older people. Um, we define people who adults who are at risk and the factors that that might make them at risk. And some of those factors will include age. So um, or may include age and, you know, potential infirmity as, as a result of that. Um, but we don't we don't. Talk, and, and, you know, there is a real line for us to, to draw here or, or, or is it, it is a real dilemma for us because we don't want to be saying that people are because they are over 65 or 65 and over that they are therefore at risk. You know, we're not saying that. But what we would want to say is we do we do need to start looking and, and some of this with some of the HMIC recommendations. The proposal is that we do need to start categorising older people because some type some criminals will target people because of their age and whether they're vulnerable or not, they will target those sort of people. So, for instance, get pension, you know, yeah. pension payments and what have you. So I think Lucy's proposal here is that she is that we um, that we do adopt the 65 as a kind of a, as a threshold for what we are defining as older people. Mm-hmm. But that we're not then defining that those people are therefore adults at risk, that they might be older people who are perfectly more capable than I am, but that we use that so that we can then build upon that. And she does chair a Crimes Against Older People Working Group, um, which she's looking to then do some profiling work, really, so that we can better understand crimes against those people and the sorts of different vulnerability that they face. So that, that was the ethical sort of issue for us to bring to you today, really, was what, what are your thoughts on us defining those people as, you know, the sort of 65 plus as being older? Thank you very much. Um, committee members, before I come in, anybody else want to? OK, you guys are leaving it to yes, me. Sorry, yes, sorry. Okay, okay. OK, yeah, go ahead. Lois and then Stephen. I was, I was just going to say it fits with... Um, NHS parameters and probably social care as well around older people so it's around the right age group I think it is difficult though because a lot will not be vulnerable so it's it's defining whether it is just for vulnerable people or not Mm -hmm. okay thank you Stephen yes uh, probably just to to echo that and and agree on the whole with the sort of uh that framework that's just been outlined you mean age is not this being of a certain age does not necessarily mean that one is vulnerable and one can be vulnerable at a younger age. And, and obviously vulnerability is both situational and can be very context dependent as well. You know, we can all be vulnerable as fit, adult, healthy individuals in certain contexts. Yeah. Uh, but the, the the problem with uh, you know, the victimisation of older people is a, is a real one and, and one that you know, should be focused upon. And I think you're right, Julie, to mention that, that that some activity is targeted at people for their age and therefore there needs to be a cut off number and 65 seems as sensible as any. Thank you. I think a a good phrase is uh, at greater risk rather than rather than vulnerable because that uh, vulnerable has a a lot of connotations with it but there are greater risks for people um, over 65 and I think that's uh, but we on the whole agreed that it's not age alone it's got to be a whole other load of other other conditions. Okay, thank you. Is that all right, Julia? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, And then we're going to move on to the Blueprint 2025 update. Um, Is that you again, Julia? It's Mr. Elliot. Andy Elliot. Okay, hi. Are you going to share screen, Andy, or are we going to look at it? Um, I can have a go at sharing the screen, yeah. Let me see whether I can. You should be able to square, share because I've got everybody set as there a... There you go. Yeah, a, it's there. It's there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So um, 
I was asked to see, uh, well, to bring you uh, an update on um, the Blueprint 2025, particularly the target operating model, which we changed in March. Yeah. So um, what I've done is just presented you with a few slides, which I'll, I'll talk your way through. Uh, and then there's just opportunities for you to ask me any questions, really. Thank you. Um, so uh, if we go on to slide uh, two, which is just a map of, of the county, really, and the, and the city, which gives you an overview really about what changed um, as part of the changes that we, we made in March. Uh, those changes were effective from the 11th of March. Uh, we moved a significant number of people around and changed the job roles all, all overnight, if you like. So on the 10th of March, they were working one way. On the 11th of March, we, we changed the way that they worked. Uh, we've got, um, uh, we changed it to four talk groups, which effectively means that they're now on uh, four linked radio groups uh, which um, combine geographically across the county and th that gives you an image of uh, in the right hand corner there uh, up here about how that works and then we also then changed uh, our neighborhood policing areas our MPAs we used to have eight we changed that to nine um, and what we did was we uh, we used to have the the kind of eastern side of the county which was Melton and Rutland linked in with um, Market Harbour as well, right the way around. So it was a, a very large geographical area that isn't isn't exactly densely populated, uh, but the geography uh, of the area presents us with lots of issues around being able to uh, get to emergency calls and things like that. So that's one of the things that we changed with that. The overall principles that we looked to were, were working together as one team. Uh, we moved to sort of geographical bases. We moved quite a number of offices out from uh, headquarters and from central places, bases out into uh, stations, which meant that we sort of redispersed and uh, relocated our police officers into the communities again. Uh, and then at the, at the bottom, uh, there's a breakdown there of how the city is configured. So there's a sort of city central left, the city centre, and then you've got west, east and south. Um, and then there's a breakdown just down here on the bottom, which I'll let you read through in your, at your own time, really, about what the, the neighbourhood police, policing officers, patrol officers are doing, and uh, also the local CID roles, uh, because we reintroduced a, a local CID that were based at local stations. So the next slide gives you an overview just about the summary. Um, I'm being told that I've got bad network quality, so I'm hoping you can all still hear me OK and see me. Uh, my network connection at home isn't very good sometimes on an afternoon. So please let me know if it conks out. Um, but the uh, the summary of the changes is is kind of listed on there. A local based CID, neighbourhood patrol officers are um, kind of an omnicompetent police officer, I would say. So what we've looked to do is rather than before we had. Uh, officers who uh, responded to incidents, then we had officers who dealt with and handled prisoners, and we had different people that were looking at doing investigations. We've kind of combined that into uh, one main role, uh, which are neighbourhood patrol officers. Um, like I said before, a locally based CID. We also had some increased uh, sergeants locally as well uh, to manage that in increase in uplifting officers. We put a new management structure in for our local policing teams and our uh, CID teams and uh, also a, a new command structure for the neighbourhood policing areas as well with different responsibilities. Overall, that go live establishment increased. So as part of the, um, uh, the PCC's uh, increase in the precept uplift and the number of additional officers that we could uh, bring in, uh, that's, that was increased from uh, 1,915 up to 1,939, which was by the end of April. Our establishment is still growing, and I think it's now somewhere around about 1,950. So it's continuing to grow. So we've got a uh, an increasing uplift in officers as those new officers come in, uh, all as part of the uh, uplift in um, the precept money, which gave us money there to uh, invest in officers. So um, when we went live on the 11th of March, I'm sure you'll remember quite well the following week, uh, we went into lockdown. Um, so we had one week of running with uh, how we expected it to work. And then we had these very strange circumstances where people were um, kind of locked into their own homes. Lots of things changed. Um, so everything kind of became uh, different. 
Um, so what we did was is we decided to survey uh, uh, the people that had been involved, well, the whole force, in fact, about the changes that had taken place uh, with um, the changes that we made on the 11th of uh, March. We ran a survey at the end of April, uh, running through into uh, early May, so about 12 to 14 days it ran for. Um, and we asked people a number of questions about what they what they thought, how they felt, how they thought it was working. And we've given you a bit of a synopsis here on, on the results. 668 people responded to the survey. Overall, there were about uh, 950 people directly impacted by the changes that we made. So people that changed roles or did something differently. Um, so overall, that's a, that's a good proportion of those people that have responded to the survey, although it went out to force overall. Uh, of those that responded, 74% were police officers, 26% police staff. Key messages that came back from that, uh, those findings were that um, we did start at an unusual time. Um, I think everybody would recognise that. Two thirds of those staff uh, that responded to the survey felt supported. Um, Two thirds of them felt prepared. Now, a third of those that maybe didn't feel supported or didn't feel prepared, it might be that they weren't actually directly involved in the changes, which is possible. Um, but also there is the fact that um, some people, well, regardless of how much you do and how much and when you change things, some people don't really like and embrace change and don't 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 take a positive view of it and are often quite quite negative about it. So in essence, two thirds is actually a fairly positive thing, and the, the third shouldn't be sort of considered to be they were unsupported. I think some of that was people weren't didn't really have a view. Um, but overall, of those that we surveyed, 50% of them thought that the target operating model would result in uh, a better quality of service. Eight out of 10 thought that the comms that we did with them were very good. And we made a particular effort with the changes that we made uh, this year compared to what we did in 2015 to make sure that we communicated fully and effectively with, with, with the workforce. Um, so it's, that's really positive to see that they've realised that. Um, but most of the people did say it was a bit too soon. Uh, to be checking everything to find out whether it works. Um, so what we've uh, decided to, what we said to them is that we're going to keep going with this, we're going to keep making adjustments and we're going to review again before the year end. So what we will do is when uh, the lockdown finishes and we turn back to some kind of normality, we'll go back and resurvey again. We'll also then be able to test all of the measures um, against the benefits that we expect from making the model changes um, that we will do. Now, the changes that we made in uh, March were only part one, really, of a, of a major change programme, which is looking to change the way that we police in Leicester, Leicester and Rutland right up to 2025. That's aligned to the National Policing Vision for 2025 as well. So what we've got and what we're working up with that, which is this next slide, is uh, we've got three main uh, chunks of work that we're doing. Uh, there's about developing and transforming the way that we work with our people how we bring people into the organisation, how we train them and how we develop them. Um, operational policing, of which the target operating model on the, the neighbourhood policing changes was the first phase. There's more to do in that around different areas of the business, particularly in um, complex crime, criminal justice and areas like that. And also IT and technology about how we're using the technology to uh, create uh, positive changes in the way that we work creating new capabilities and uh, making it more efficient and effective. So within this process, we've got these kind of three programs or pillars of work. Sat at the top of that is the change board uh, for which the PCC is a member. Uh, they're there to overview, give a strategic overview, evaluate change, make sure that we realise benefits and monitor progress. Uh, underneath those kind of pillars, and within those pillars, we've got delivery boards, delivery leads, um, for different areas of business and areas of work. Uh, we have a design authority. That design authority is there to kind of talk through with the, the, the key business people, uh, both police staff and police officers, what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, how we're going to go and do it, to generate new bits of business, develop business cases, explore benefits, uh, but also to potentially reject ideas that, that may not fit in or may not be perceived to deliver the benefits we expect. So that was just a bit of an overview there with that. Within the workforce programme itself, we've got kind of three big chunks or three big areas that, that we're looking to sort of uh, deliver. One's about the, the, the sort of pipeline of delivery of offices. So for um, 
for policing, certainly for Leicestershire, uh, we are expecting in the next three years with the uplift in number of officers, but also the rate of retirement, uh, almost 45% uh, of our workforce will have less than um, three years service uh, in about three to four years time, looking at the way that it's progressing out at the minute. Uh, that means we've got lots of new people coming in. We want to make that process as slick, effective and efficient as possible. We need to make sure that we train them up uh, and get them into that kind of uh, way of working. So we've got lots of changes taking place in the way we train, the way we bring people in, some that have been driven by COVID because we've turned to a lot of uh, remote training, uh, whereas many of it was done in classrooms based before, so we've changed that. Uh, so that's kind of the pipeline into the force. Uh, the workplace piece is about um, the compelling experience and, and being the employer of choice, if you like. So we've called it Workplace 2.0. So we're trying to redefine and uh, reshape how, how the Leicestershire Police looks and works from a from a people perspective and then also an element about the careers because many people now are coming into policing with degrees they're looking and expecting it to be a career for them how do we do that how do we develop that and how do we utilize the skills as well that people bring in um, to make best use of that aligned with that we're also looking at making best use of our data and and people analytics uh, to make sure that we understand how our people are working um, what we need them to do, what's working, what's not working, understanding skills and capabilities. So we've got the right people, right place, right time, right skills. Also looking at the sort of team Leicestershire people offer and brand. So making sure that we're giving that a local uh, local brand that's understood internally. And also obviously we're looking at the diversity and equalities, innovation and, 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 and difference with what we can do and making sure that we're making use of uh, everybody's skills and everybody's uniqueness uh, to bring uh, policing and help policing move forwards. Next slide is just a bit of an overview about the target operating model itself. Uh, of each of the layers, we've done it in, in layers. Um, the reason that we did this is uh, this was part of the process we used for our uh, first phase of the target operating model. It allows us to um, understand how everything links together from um, the external point of view from prevention and from stopping demand and getting people to uh, get advice and guidance and self-serve if you like and prevent crime in the first place. Layer one which is our sort of contacts which is through our contact centre and also our new service channels uh, making sure that they work efficiently and effectively. Uh, layer two is policing in neighbourhoods which is what we've changed in March with uh, the, the changes for the target operating model. Layer three our investigations protecting vulnerable people, layer four custody and criminal justice and then the layer five are the support services that wrap around those and linked in and cross-cutting we've got these people themes and digital themes as well that, that map into all of that. In the technology world, some of the focus that we've got going on uh, over the next uh, year and, and beyond are things like digital evidence. Digital evidence is providing um, uh, digitising, I suppose, uh, case files uh, that are going to the Crown Prosecution Service and making that process efficient and effective uh, and trying to make that a fully digitised process as well. So we aren't sort of generating paper files and things like that that slow the process down. We're in the process of implementing Office 365. So currently for running exactly parallel to this meeting is our first uh, internal um, official teams meeting that we're running. Um, so we're doing that for our COVID gold group. So I'm hoping that that's working well. There's a lot of effort going into that this week. Uh, we've got the Emergency Services Network, which is the uh, network that um, connects all our offices. We currently use uh, airwave radios. Those airwave radios become start to become more and more obsolete as time goes by. So this Emergency Services Network uses the 4G uh, network that we all, most of us use for our mobile phones and gives us a dedicated bandwidth upon that. So that's looking to be implemented uh, in the next few years. Uh, there's an implementation that I think that now follows on from the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in 2022. So I think it's September 22 when that's going to be implemented. Uh, a product called Pronto, uh, which is a uh, application that sits on officers' mobile phones that allows them to interact with our systems and uh, key in once rather than key in multiple times. So that, that's that's in now, but we've got ongoing developments, including things like a case file component that's about to be launched soon. 
Uh, we have upgrades to our command and control system, which is something called Storm. Uh, we also have a significant number of national IT programs that are going on at the minute as well, which are changing the way that policing works, linked in with some of the national systems, and which is also starting to move things more to the cloud rather than being on premise. Uh, so that's a significant change for policing. And then last but not least, essential maintenance. Um, so for all of the systems and things that we've currently got that we're using policing uh, that have a digital or technical footprint, we've got them, we use them, we have to keep them running. So as well as sort of keeping the lights on and keeping everything going, the other things then just get added on top. So it's a, it's a changing and complex world. And, and, and that was it, really. That was me done, if that's OK. Thank you very much, Andy. That's that very, very helpful to, to, for you to go through that. Um, I'll switch my video on again. You can stop sharing your screen now if that's OK. Thank you. And let me just see if there's any hands raised. Anybody want to come in on that? Can I? Lynn does. So I'll bring Lynn in, then I've got a question as well. Lynn? Yes, I, I'm interested if there's an expectation that the public will view the differences, as it were, see differences in um, the service, and if there's feedback for them on how they're experiencing the changes. Good question. Yep. So the, the intention is that um, we're going to do a survey. We want to do a, a public survey. So whether we do that as part of the sort of annual survey process that we do or we do something different. Uh, but one of the measures is uh, the measures of success is about understanding the public perception of the changes. Um, and that was always defined as being the method of measurement would be to go through a um, kind of a, a sort of a survey process and, and ask people what they think and whether they've seen a difference. Um, we would probably do that after a period of time um, and obviously COVID, the, the COVID pandemic has, has made everything very strange for us and it's trying to work out now when people get back to normal and start and get out and about, are they starting to see a difference from the, the way that the, the force is policing and particularly the visibility I suppose because that's the main thing that they should do to see a difference. There are more officers based locally, more, more officers moving around in cars in their local areas rather than coming out from headquarters. So they should see a difference, I hope. Julia. Thank you. Just to add, just to, add to that, I mean, right at the heart of all of these changes, this locality sort of based policing it is all around neighbourhood policing as well. So um, that's absolutely in support of that local policing, which we know leads very much into public confidence. So we have we, we have invested in some additional surveying um, through existing through existing contacts, which we do need to extend into wider contacts um, through a system called Neighbourhood Link. Um, and we're doing some some work with neighbourhood policing now just to sort of baseline within different communities how well they think we're doing. Um, so whilst it's not an ideal time to be doing it with COVID, because things are obviously very different, um, we have actually done a sort of baseline survey around COVID and then looking into communities to see how, you know, what, what community priorities are and how they feel we're doing. Um, asking some very similar questions to those that were asked in the British Crime Survey. So I think that will link into that, you know, the, the neighbourhood policing is very intrinsic to the new target operating model work. It's not, you know, not sort of separate. Thank, thank you, Julia. Um, I've got Stephen. Yes, uh, thank you. Just a follow up there from, from what Julie was saying. And, and you know, it, it, it is clear that this it is a, a model that's trying to put neighbourhood policing more at the heart of what you do, which I think is a, you know, inevitably and in, inherently a good thing in policing. Uh, but that often you know, raises questions about you know, how do we define and, and what is the neighbourhood? And you, you mentioned, Julie, there in terms of trying to get community priorities. Obviously, one of the difficulties with neighbourhood policing is uh, you know, reaching those hard to reach communities around what their concerns are and what their priorities are. And just what, I wanted to know if you could follow up there and, and sort of outline the work that you're doing in that regard uh, in terms of so you get a full view of what the community wants rather than just the usual suspects who tell you what they want. Yeah, it's a really, um, really important point. And, and I wouldn't for a minute claim that we've 
that we've got it all nailed um, at the moment, and particularly with um, with COVID, because as you'll appreciate, we've completely cut down on all of our face-to-face -face consultation um, methods. But so what we've done in the interim is um, is we're using um, some new surveying technology, some sort of a new surveying tool that we've got through Neighbourhood Link. Now um, the, these are very definitely. Um, people who have signed up to us, so I'm not saying in any uh, to any extent that you know they've signed up to agree to be part of Neighbourhood Link and to receive information from us. So we've got a big database, it's nearly 15,000 people. Um, so we're doing surveys across there, but the, the plan going forward with COVID will be that, that we will then triangulate that into other groups, into community forums to try to get a full picture, because I completely agree, those, those harder to reach groups, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that we've got that absolutely um, absolutely nailed down in terms of in terms of our our consultation with them. What what this new um, the, the, the new sort of technology that we're using does do for us is it encourages people to sort of self identify into different types of groups and so so which we 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 haven't really had in any sophisticated way before. So that's really helpful for us to to be able to identify um, the sort of I mean it's very much experience based type. Uh, methodology but it, it's helpful for us to start to understand and we are literally at the start of the journey of really understanding where um where people people from different groups might be impacted differently around around confidence so but further work to be done and stuff that I, i'd be really happy i mean it's it's this is in my portfolio i'd be really happy to engage at a few future date with this committee and also to seek your views and ideas actually as to how we could do that better that's a great offer thanks thanks julia so if anybody is interested in following up on that, please just uh, let me know outside of this meeting. I have one question for you, um, Andy. On the diagram, which has got the, the layers in, the, in a circle, um, so layer five, support services, it, it seems to fit on the circle after the most severe <laughs> layer on custody and criminal justice. But I guess I, I would wanted to ask you, what is included in that support services? And I'm presuming it's not just for people who've been through the criminal justice system. No, so by, by support services, we, we mean uh, the services, the back office services that support frontline policing. Um, so it's our HR functions, our IT functions, fleet, estates, finance, all those kind of elements. Okay. Um, because they're, they're kind of the invisible bit of policing, I suppose, that the, 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 the general public don't see. Uh, mm -hmm. But without the right fleet in place that's serviced, running and operational, the buildings set up, working, operating, the IT and technology, um, policing kind of doesn't work as effectively as it should do. So what we've got to do is make sure that they're able to deliver what policing needs to be able to police LLR. Oh, I get sense. it. I get it. So that kind of, that layer five kind of runs through every other layer. Yeah, it kind of fits in and it's got touch points with everything. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on at that point. Uh, Are you OK to... if I if I leave? Yes. I have another meeting to join. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Um, I'm going to move on now to hate crime, which is paper E. And I believe, Julia, you're going to introduce it for us. Me again. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so hopefully the paper is self-explanatory what i would have it might have been helpful to send with this was um rather than the the original appendix which i don't think was really um the right thing was our service specification um which mm. is mentioned at, at section seven um but it, it but is now complete because so i think this paper was originally written for, for the meeting in march um, and, and subsequent to that, we've now agreed our service specifications. So to put this into context, I suppose the question that we're asking in terms of an ethical dilemma is obviously hate, hate crime spans across a very wide variety of different sorts of offences. Um, from the very, very serious, you know, you could have a racially um, motivated murder, for instance, right down to the lower end where um, it might be some... some um, name calling or some social media um, sort of bullying that has a hate element to it. 
So, so it so it goes across every single offence type, as as you'd appreciate. Um, hate crime is increasing in terms of the volume that we're having reported, which we say is a good thing because it's where people are are confident to come forward and report it. Um, and it's the national trend is that it's increasing, and we welcome that. And we have dedicated resources um, where we go we we're, we're going into establishments to try to encourage people to report incidents so that we can so that we can deal with them. Um, I suppose there's the, the issue for us is really, and, I, and it's a real, um, it feels like a bit of a no brainer for me, really, but is whether or not, for, fortunately, that the vast majority of our hate crime incidents and crimes, so there's a difference between a crime and an incident, the vast majority are at the very lower level, sort of lower level public order name calling rather than the very serious assaults and what have you. But we don't underestimate the impact that that still has on the victim. And so the service specification that we've, we've developed recognises that and deals with it as a special category um, through which we give an enhanced service, even where the, the offence itself or the incident itself on the face of it to some people might not appear to be that serious. So, so I suppose the ethical issue for us, which... Um, you know, for me is a, a real no brainer is actually should, you know, are we right to be diverting resource um, into, um, you know, to, to, to deal with hate crime as an enhanced crime and to ensure that we are using resource appropriately for that. Um, and, um, and that is pretty much actually the, the, the nature of the, the sort of ethical element of the, of yep. the dialogue. And I think the rest of the paper is just giving you some background context and information about what we're doing locally. Thank so you. Was a, take any questions. It was a very interesting paper. I re really enjoyed uh, reading it. Not not the content for you, know what I mean. I don't enjoy reading about hate crime, but it was really good to see that. And it, it, I think it would be good to have um, the service spec that you were talking about yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Um, committee members, anything, things that you want to raise? I'll have a couple of points myself, but OK. Um, so we agree that the ethical question if you like about the premium service on hate crime is is right and that we do it partly because of the historical um, lack of attention in this area and also the lack of coming forward in this area so now that that is increasing and there are better ways of dealing with it and there is more guidance we do think that that is right that there is it's almost like a you know, we know there was an uneven playing field before, and it's now trying to make sure that we're we're we're, we're doing things that uh, that really send a signal that the force is taking this issue very seriously and will will not be will not be tolerated. So we we appreciate what you're doing there, and we do, we do think that your your no brainer is right. <laughs> Um, so that I'll bring Stephen in in a minute, but while I I have speaking, I just want there's two other quick comments that I wanted to make on page E3 there's a kind of one sentence which says throughout COVID-19 we are monitoring and feedback any related hate crimes I would really like a bit more detail there um, so you know to me that I, that just begged a lot more questions I would really like to know what what is what's the current p p position what's increasing where the spikes are etc and the, the the last um comment from me julia was again i'm sorry to keep raising it but the equality impact assessment our service delivery is consistent across the seven strands of hate crime that we record i have no idea what that consistency means because in a way I don't want it to be consistent. I want it to. I want it to to be really adaptable and flexible to each each one. So I just want to know a bit more about what that actually what that actually means. Okay. If, well, if I just pick both those points up yeah. now. So just in terms of the um, the hate crime through COVID nineteen. Yeah. Um, so, so we have a um, a daily intelligence document that is assessing um, every single. Um, COVID related incidents um, and we're also then having I had a, it's now gone to a fortnightly performance meeting that I chair that we're, we're assessing right. what's happening bear in mind COVID kind of landed right at the start of Tom I, we've had a you know, we've had to put some real kind of close wrap around Tom being target operating model um, to, 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 to make sure we were on top of 
managing our sort of demand and performance. So we've had a, some real detailed scrutiny around all crime, including hate crime as part of that. So what we did, and t- particularly in the early stages of COVID, and you'll have seen nationally elsewhere, um, but some, there's been some hate crime directed particularly at the Chinese community, um, because that, there was that perception yeah, yeah. that the Chinese community had, you know, that that's where it had started. And, and so, um, so there had been some, some hate crime directed at them. We haven't experienced that there. So, so as an example, that's one of the things that I've picked up through my weekly meeting. We have a, a, a hate crime. We, we've had no peak or no, um, we've actually had a slight reduction in hate crime because people weren't out and about. Um, most of our hate crime is people shouting in the street at each other, you know, people shouting at racial abuse or comments, that that kind of comment. Um, that, that's what most of our hate crime um, is. And because people haven't been out and about, we've had slightly less. Um, we did have a little spate of, of, of in the city, um, but the individual for that, that was actually where somebody was putting swastikas um, in places. The, the individual, and there were 20, 20 offences um, for that, which we caught, so that actually showed our hate crime going up. The um, we've caught them; they've been dealt with, and we don't think that was COVID related. So, so we've monitored it uh, to see how uh, were I, my. So I was running our goals response. My fear was that we would start to have hate crime directed at certain communities that was related mm. to COVID. We haven't actually had that. Good. So we monitor on a daily basis, but we haven't had any COVID related hate crime, and specifically, we didn't have the. Um, hate crime against um, Chinese people and I did actually go into our hate crime officer we have a dedicated hate crime officer to say to them have we got the right contacts to know if people are experiencing issues and just not reporting it and so she's gone back into um, those elements of the community and and made you know had those conversations so I'm pretty happy in terms of where we are in terms of hate crime and COVID. Um, Any questions? Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you so much. And thank, thanks for taking it so so seriously that you're actually, you know, being proactively investigating and asking the right questions. So thank you for that. No, that's, that's, you, that, that's as I see it, as we should be doing. Um, and then in terms of the equality impact assessment, I think what we're saying there, and I, and I can see, um, I think we probably just need to review how, how these papers sometimes, how that's being presented. OK, that's What fine. that's saying is we deal with all hate crime in... So, so the specification talks about, so I've got a copy of it here, just to prove that it, it does exist. And it talks about the sorts of assessments that we'll make around victims. It talks about these are the considerations to take into account. What that's right. saying in terms of equality impact assessment is we do that for every sort of crime. So whether it's a racial hate crime or a hate crime in terms of sexuality or we we take those same considerations into into account each time we get a hate crime. Uh-huh, I see. Okay. So we're Thank dealing you. with equally, but, but uh, you know, yeah, according to their needs. Thank you very much. Anything else, anybody? No? Okay, I'm going to move on. Thank no, you. Remember, Karen, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Stephen? I, yeah, I still wanted to come back on the on the sort of the start and ethical question. Oh, yeah. Uh, around the, the, the enhanced service. And, sorry, uh, Stephen. Yes, you did, yeah. yeah. It was, it was one of the things I, 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 I mentioned this morning. So I, 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 I would agree with what Karen said earlier, Julia, about how having an enhanced service is important, both in terms of, of the history, but I think we can put that in a wider context as well. If, if we think of hate crime in itself, you know, as you mentioned yourself, it does, yeah. it does cover a broad spectrum of offences. But one of the things that the law clearly does is it recognises the hate element as an aggravated element. Yeah. In that sense, that does... You know, if you put it in terms of a harm index or a, or a thrive approach, I mean the impact of crime is uh, is on average you know, more has more of an impact upon the individual. But I think as well in, in, in justifying that uplifting resources, it also has an impact upon the community as a whole, uh, and that impact upon the community is something which I think should be taken into account and therefore rightly prioritising it. And also, it's if we think about in the communities that are being targeted again they they historically or some of them historically have you know, distrusted the police so this is really important for mm. legitimacy police community relations and trust in the police which is we all know is really important to allow you to do your job you need to be able to work well with members of the public so for me i would agree it's it's a no-brainer uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, I forgot to bring you. I saw your hand come up and then it shot down, so I thought maybe you'd... Oh, because you you said, yeah, you'd already noticed it, so I don't want to keep it up there. It's like being in class with your hand perfectly up. <laughs> was it aching? Was your hand, was your arm aching? <laughs> <laughs> OK, cool. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I'll move on then to the paper on papers on fraud. Um, and Julia, is that you again? I'm sorry. I, 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 we should have had. I think I did see. I did see um, which Ward did eventually join the meeting. I'm not not expecting him to talk about the fraud paper, but you might get somebody different from me. Okay. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think what what's been outlined in this paper is, I suppose it's it, it's the volume of fraud that we have to deal with. It's kind of giving you some background and some information just about the national setup through action fraud. Um, and the way that fraud comes into the force through that kind of um, filter and the fact that you know when you when you look at you know it's, it, it is nationally a really significant issue mm. fraud. Um, and if you look at from the last year so we've had nearly 5,000 reports from action fraud we've then had you know 16 million pounds worth and 830 referrals into the force so really significant issue but we still then have to undertake a bit of a um, triage process. And I think that's what was attached with the, um, the policy was just that triage process, that kind of this is how we're dealing, um, you know, how we manage fraud within force. We have invested in our resources. Um, and I think really just looking at the page, and what, mine's called page F1, which I'm not sure if it's meant to be called F1, but the question there um, around the preliminary inquiries, do, do we agree that we need to be do these um, criminal inquiries, uh, th these um, preliminary questions, um, and that the um, viability assessment undertaken, that that is a proportionate sort of approach for us to take. Um, so that was really what I'd invite us, well, any, any further discussion around, well, any of it really, uh, but those points in particular. I can't hear you, Karen. Be on mute. Just come back. I am on mute. I'm going to invite um, Lynn in a minute to, to make a couple of comments. Um, but just to give you a little bit of advance warning, we were confused by the questions. We didn't get their meaning in the way that they're, they're written. So we might need you to explain a bit more on that in a minute. Um, Lynn, did you want to make your comments? Uh, yes, the comments I have weren't on those questions, actually, no, they but, weren't. Um, but they were really following up on some of the information on the background and current position. Um, so I was interested to know what might have changed in terms of the coordination, intelligence sharing and partnership working with other counter fraud stakeholders in Leicestershire and, and have things improved since the inspection. That's question number one. And the second one is around the percentage of fraud that's preventable. We, we see from the next paper that 90% of cybercrime is preventable. Um, and we want to learn more about how, how the force works with partners to animate and, and disseminate messages to the public and vulnerable groups beyond things like information on the website, which is great, but you have to visit the website to, to learn about it. Yep, thank you. Okay, do you want me to pick those up yeah, now? Yes, please. So yeah. Start with the second one. So um, I, I think things since the inspection have definitely improved. So I think this is a national picture, um, at, but 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 um, represented locally as well. So so it is it is recognised through all of the tasking mechanisms that we have from national through to regional to local that fraud is a really big issue of concern that, that impacts significantly um, on our communities, significantly, but also but quite often not visibly within our communities. You know, it's not like the, you know, it's not a broken window, is it? Um, so so I think I, I think our, our partnership working um, throughout all of the tasking processes has has really become, you know, quite sophisticated. Um, what was noted earlier and I use an example for this that this year we've had um, a real increase in what we call courier fraud so this is where people will make pe people will target um, 
areas um, and, and, and phone areas, but very often it is elderly people within these areas. And we're not absolutely sure how they pick their people, but they will they will focus in an area. So earlier this year, we did have an area um, within the county that was focused upon. And they'll start cold calling and saying, I'm, I'm pretending to be a police officer and saying, your account's been compromised. I need to come and take you to the bank and go and get some money out of the bank. It's called courier fraud. Um, and we, we this started to emerge as a national picture and that we think actually the the offenders were based in London. So just in terms of partnership working, the type of activity that we then undertook, and this was really from a neighbourhood policing perspective, was that we've we've really got into the banks. We've really gone and done that work um, to go and warn the banks, so physically to warn the banks. If you have, you know, somebody turning up wanting to withdraw £5,000 from their account cash, you need to be asking questions. You know, you need to be thinking about this. We've then gone through our older persons network groups and given the messages out in those areas. So, so it's a kind of practical example, and it's an ongoing example. And actually, I've seen in within the region today, within our regional briefing, where there's a pocket that's come up elsewhere in the region, where there's a DCI Mason from London. They always use the same name. They're not very clever, but they're obviously successful because they use this name, DCI Mason. If he ever phones you, don't don't. <laughs> Don't let him, and he's going to send you a taxi. Don't don't get in it. Um, but it's it's a it's, those themes have been picked up, um, and I think that partnership working where previously it wouldn't have been as effective. I think I think now we are a lot better. And we recognise the extent of the problem. So um, I think so. I, so I think that answers the second part, just in terms of where we are. Um, you know, the monitoring that goes through. So action fraud, actually, that being the centralised um, national run through the city of London, um, you know, that's actually really helpful to have that as the national as the national forum. Because if you think about it, a lot of this fraud might be taking place, might be commissioned in foreign countries. So the kind of local ownership issue, we have a, an agreement about how they identify people who will be vulnerable. They might be vulnerable, not necessarily vulnerable to further activity, but vulnerable by virtue of their frailty or whatever, and where we will go and meet them. So I think I, I do think we are in a much stronger place than we previously were. Um, but so much of this is cyber enabled. You know, it, it is a real issue to tackle it. I, so that's answered, I think, one of the questions. I'm sorry, I can't remember what the first part of the question was. Lynn? The first part was about the intelligence sharing and pa partnership oh. working with counter fraud and stakeholders. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so, so I'm I'm not um, it's not I, I don't lead in terms of economic crime, um, you know, so I couldn't go into huge into massive detail any, any more than I have done. But I know that we are in a much stronger place and certainly in our tasking arrangements um, and the, um, you know, we have a, a regional um, shared intelligence cell within the ROCU. So um, I think we are in a stronger place, but still still work to be done. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Lynn, is that OK for you? Yeah, OK for me. Thanks. Now, um, if we could return to your ethical questions, yeah. um, Julia. Stephen, I think you know the answers, but maybe not the question. Is that right? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I don't know which is better. <laughs> I wouldn't like that. Uh, I, I, I mean, in the I wouldn't put it more in terms of, you know, if I think what the question is asking, uh, an answer to it, yeah. but I, I would rather that Julia sort of elaborate okay. on what she thinks. All right, I, don't, I, didn't wanna, I knew you wanted to say something on this. I didn't want to miss you again. So let me bring Julia in to try and clarify first. OK, so I think the question, um, and, and I've not got the policy in front of me because I didn't print it out, um, So and I don't want to go onto my computer to get it, but I think... Um, within our policy, I think we've got some some questions that we're asking about viability assessment. So how viable is an inquiry? So so whilst we take fraud very seriously, there are we're still having to ask viability questions around: Are oh, is this likely to go anywhere? Is this likely to be, to lead to a successful prosecution um, when we get these ones that are sent through from action fraud? So I think that um, we do these preliminary inquiries. If you're looking at the question, we're saying. Um, and page 13, 14 links mm. back to the policy. And I think it's that that's the viability assessment. Are we, do we accept that we need to be almost screening out some of those crimes that we just don't think are ever going to lead, that are going to be a disproportionate effort for us to um, to continue with the inquiries um, because we've simply not got the resource to do it? 
Right. Does, does that make sense, Stephen? Y yes, uh, it's actually, it's, I think that's more simpler than actually that I thought it was in terms of how, how the question was framed. Uh, this, I mean, this is a perennial issue in policing, not just in policing of frauds. Uh, you, you, no matter how many more officers you get, there's always going to be more crime than you can fully investigate. And you, mm. you therefore have to make uh, some sort of choice. And, and, and you make that on the basis of you know, the impact of the crime upon the victim or, or the community at large and, and what the likelihood is of being able to solve it. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, for the more serious high level frauds, of, of course, you're going to throw more resources at those, even if at the start it might look like it's not you know, in a great chance of recovery or a great chance of you know, getting a result. And at the same time, for lower levels, you might choose to, again, just give advice to the victim about next time rather than actually doing anything. But for me, the importance there from an ethical point of view is having a process in mm. work, it sounds like you do have one. Having a process that operates in a way that's consistent, that gives a you know, consistent level of performance. The you know, similar victims will be will be treated similarly in similar crimes and will be will be treated similarly. The, the one thing I would add to that, though, and as you've I think you've, you've indicated, you know, I was going to say it's a growing problem. We don't know if it's a growing problem. We, we're increasingly aware of fraud as a problem. Uh, I think this is one of those offences that we. You know, we are not going to have a sense of, of the underlying rate of, of crime, in particular is indicated because a lot of uh, victims will never be aware they've been victims of, 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 of fraud. Uh, but because it is happening in more sophisticated ways, and again, you indicated this earlier, one of the things of at least making preliminary inquiries and doing some work on almost every case is it gives you a sense of what the picture looks like. It gives you a sense of patterns. It gives you more intelligence. But you can then start to join those dots as you suggested earlier and say, actually, we've got a problem with this particular form of offence in this area. Mm. And that means even though you might not be able to directly go after the perpetrators, you then can do, again, going back to neighbourhood policing, you can then do more problem-orientated work where you can contact you know, potential local victims in advance and, and do the work to prevent rather than the, the tackles with after the event. So I think, I think there's a balance there. Yes, you shouldn't be throwing resources after hopeless cases, but the more that you are able to do, the more you can build up a picture that gives you uh, a, a better roadmap of how you can do the prevent work, if nothing else. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I think that that's um, yeah, that's what a, a good point to make that there needs to be that balance because unless we can monitor the trends and patterns, even of the ones that are not being taken forward, um, we won't know whether they need to be in the future. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm sorry to do it again, but the quality impact assessment, uh, there are no, it says there are no expected or no anticipated impacts, but I. Uh, I could immediately think there might be some like language issues or uh, in, in dealing with victims of fraud. Um, so I, I just yeah, again would just appeal to people to put in more than there is nothing anticipated or everything's OK. Put in a little bit more on equality impact assessments, please. Just on that, I, I mean, yeah. I think because because we tend to put equality impact assessments around a change in policy or i mean i don't know angela it might be one we need to take out outside of here just in terms of reports but um okay i so, I, I i i think for, for you know i i just we just need to be really clear around whilst we do want because this is i suppose is our I, well i suppose it's asking the, the question isn't it around is there any for us what that means is is there any adverse impact on any as a result of this on any particular section of the community or people within the community sorry Angela you're looking to come in yeah I, I think what that, that's asking and I think the sort of thing that could be written there is quite simply that you have undertake the undertaken the EIA on the policy and yeah, right. if that EIA showed an adverse impact what you've done about it and I yeah. think it just needs a couple of sentences on okay. that Julia yeah that would be yeah that's fine and i definitely take the point that if you you know for the original policy has had an impact assessment you don't keep need you don't need to keep doing it unless there's something new which might uh, yeah. change the original um but yeah that's that's fine okay i'm going to move on to cybercrime 
Is it? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, again, it is. So, yeah. um, that, that, that's... The, the papers there um, with the information about the, you know, the, again, it's a hugely developing, complex yeah. area of work for us. Um, I, I think the paper is informative. I'm not actually sure there's really an ethical dilemma in it, I've got to say, but because I think we've sort of said ethical considerations, it's just, you know, mm. we're not getting lots and lots of outcomes from some of the work we're putting into there, but, but is it? Is it worth the investment? And again, I just, you know, our digital hub within Leicester is, is seen as a real, um, you know, as, as a real beacon nationally of good practice. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I I leave it sort of open for any any questions for people um, around around anything in the report. Um, I think it's more informative than really presenting us with an ethical dilemma or a question. Yeah, I mean, there were some questions in the, where are they, on page G5, they're yeah. in, in amongst the points, I think it was, there were questions at 22, 23, 27 and 30. Um, and this morning we did have a brief consideration of these. So I think it is worth um, just saying what, what we said at those at the meeting this morning. Um, I'm going to invite Lynn or Lois or Stephen or Gail Linda, to say anything about those. <laughs> OK, so. Um, colleagues, what we said this morning was that on 22, is it ethical that due to funding and key performance indicators leading to this, that we investigate 100 uh, oh, percent and. Karen, Lois oh, had a full moment there. Oh, OK, I couldn't see Lois. Yeah, Lois, Lois go ahead. Lois, go ahead. Sorry, it was just to say about the um, ethical dilemmas was the one around safeguarding that I'd said yeah. that I felt that there were um, issues around safeguarding in terms of we all have responsibilities for safeguarding for children. And if, if it hasn't been investigated, we do have a responsibility to report because we actually don't know what the information is. So we do need to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? I can't. I, for some reason, I couldn't see Lois's hand just then. So, just um, if you do need to say anything, please just shout. Um, so, I, I was going to say, Julia, that it's kind of a similar answer to the one we gave before um, about in the in the fraud and hate crime. Sorry, that um, it's it's difficult to know until you do some monitoring, and because it's a new area. Um, it, it is right that there is more attention that's given to, to cybercrime until we're able to pick up um, the, the patterns, the trends. Um, but if you, you know, there has to be a judgment in some cases that you're just not going to get a result. But I think these, it's just difficult. The training, the resourcing and the time are all necessary so that you can pick up the patterns and the trends in, in, the, in the longer run. Um, I think, yeah, similar answer to the to the next to 27 as well. And are we doing and we thought 30, are we doing enough to identify and divert potential offenders at 31, 32, 33? Yeah, we thought they were pretty good points. So thank you for that. Thanks, Julia, on, on that one. Um, we're going to move on to recruitment, diversity and representation. And this is one where we had asked for it to come back to us. So um, is this going to be introduced by you, Julia? It is, yes. So, um, so I don't know whether you've had this particular paper before or, um, or whether it was whether this is a completely new paper for you. Um, it's, been, it's been updated. OK, so. Um, I mean, again, it sort of describes where we are. It describes at point four the, um, or it, it, it talks about our vision at point three. Sorry, the, the, the HR yeah. vision. Um, it describes what's happening in terms of recruitment, and it describes um, where we are in terms of um, representation currently. And I think, you know, I think it's a it's a work in progress, and I don't think we would we are where we want to end up. 
that we are moving in the right direction, I think, would be um, would be a fair assessment. And we have made some real positive progress in mm. terms of representation. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I wasn't going to go through the paper. If, if you've had, it might be useful for you to come to me with questions if you have them. I think we'll do that, Julia, because we did. We all had read it. So let's yeah. uh, let's just pick up some questions. I know that, Lynn, you had some points that you wanted to make. I do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, I wanted to, um, well, I have asked for some additional pieces of information that, that we think um, would be helpful to us, really, in terms of the bigger picture and seeing trends over time. So we're very interested in seeing the baseline figures for diversity breakdown of both the force by officers and staff and also the community for 2009-10, so that we can compare 10 years over to compare with the current position um, that are described at points eight and nine. So that's the, that's the first bit of information that we would find really helpful. And the second is that um, attrition rates through the recruitment process, it'd be really interesting to see those for white candidates so that we can compare with the diversity breakdown at point 15. Yeah. OK, so so I have and, and, and I, I do need to just apologise because um, because I think some of the your requests have got slightly stuck due to one of our key members of staff not being available. So we have got some data to come back, but I've only had it come back today. So um, and I and, and I don't like to say this because it's uh, I don't want to say let's defer it for another meeting, but I've, I've got some data, um, but I'm not sure. So I've got from 2009. The police officers um, are overall, this is the police officers, our overall BAME rep proportions was 6.65%. So comparing mm -hmm. that with um, where we are now, we've, we've got ours, I, I can break that into gender, but, but with 6.65% overall, 12.82% for PCSOs and 9% for staff. So I think um, the way they've broken it down isn't exactly the same as what's in no. that, yeah. that thing there. But I think it shows where we have made some progress. But I think, you know, I do wonder whether whether you'd prefer that to come back as actually a bit of a written update um, at some point. But they're, but they're the figures that have been provided. Um, yeah, I think it would be useful to have that as written data because it's obviously hard to yeah. compare. Yeah. And I think Sorry, carry on. So, so I've got a table of, of information that's been sent to me, but I think it'd be worth, and I'm really sorry because it means updating this report again, um, but but we can, but it, but it is just where it got stuck in the system with one of our members of staffing on annual leave. So that was that particular question um, around, and it is broken into the female and male elements as well. Um, and then the, um, the, non dame attrition rate question at 15. Um, again, I just had a quick look at that and, and it's not broken down in the same way as that data is there, which again, I think would be helpful, but it does show, I think, that the um, that the white attrition rate is, is that basically the, the BAME attrition rate really kicks in when we get to the search, the national search um, process. But I think it'd be helpful to see that the 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 what the, the the white attrition rate in this in that same um, table, which it hasn't been provided in. So yeah. I think I mean, that would be I on. think that would be really useful for us to be able to really scrutinise that because that's going to help us in terms of ethical issues and also to where we might think you might want to look deeper. Yeah. 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 Some of the questions that we've then asked in this paper are about, you know, should we focus only in terms of our underrepresented groups, in terms of some of the assistance that we're giving outside in terms of recruitment? And I think that's just a slightly, you know, wider conversation would probably be helpful with that with that information in the background. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, just one of the reasons we asked for this paper to come back to us was because we wanted to see the HR vision for the for the force for the workforce and we thank you for putting that in um, and please don't take this as anything other than meaning, meaning to be helpful but as a vision statement we think it's far too long um, and the key sentences would be 
Leicestershire Police will have people with first rate capabilities and commitment, earn the admiration and respect of our communities and will be diverse and inclusive, at least at least representing the communities we serve. The rest of it, I think, can go in the bullet points underneath. Um, mm. it, if, uh, but we do thank you for doing that. So it's just, uh, you know, just a comment really on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I should feed that back. It's again, it's it's um, um, unfortunately Alistair, who would normally come and present this, isn't available um, today. He's, he's got a diary clash, so I shall feed it back to him. That's fine. OK, thank you. Um, anything else, anybody? Just shout because I'm not looking at the Zoom at the Teams call at the moment. OK, no one's shouting. So we'll move on to ethical dilemmas. Um, let me get that paper up. Um, and we did have some discussion about this, these. So I'm going to invite any members of the committee to come in at this stage. Can I see any hands? No? Gail, did you want to say anything about this? Because I think you had some clear views this morning. I'm sorry, I'm, I've kind of um, lost where we are on my paperwork. Can you just... Um, oh, I'm so sorry. It's um, fine. So Can we'll... you just, just go over again what the actual uh, the dilemma that I, we were discussing? I do remember it, but I, I don't want to get okay, the yep, end of the sure. stick. So it's about a guy that's preaching in the city centre um, and expressing his views that homosexuals would go to hell. And what, what the questions were were really what... what um, if, if the officer assesses that it's no crime, um, should it be considered as a hate incident? And does Article 10 of the Human Rights Act come kick in about freedom of expression? And the third part of the question was, what's the most appropriate response for the police? Yeah, I do remember the discussion we had this morning. I mean, my, my view was I did think that it would be, it did have a clear potential to um, incite hatred. Um, and I know that we had quite a discussion about it. Um, I think on the face of it, we can say that, yes, this person may have... Uh, cause for you know saying that there needs to be freedom of speech but I think there is a clear and strong potential for it to incite hatred so um, my view was that it was it was fairly clear cut and that should be something that even though may not be seen as criminal um, it should be something that we you know wouldn't tolerate. Uh -huh. Thank you. Stephen did you want to add because I think you it's quite um, helpful what you said about the um... Human Rights Act and its limitations. Well, I, I yeah, I, I saw this as a as a very difficult scenario, one, and actually one that I wouldn't want to be a frontline police officer having to deal with this. Uh, I I could see a frontline officer could get themselves tied up in knots trying to think about what what the correct approach would be, because I think there's a lot going on there from a even if you just think about it in terms of a legal perspective, and I obviously have to give the caveat that I'm not, I'm not a human rights lawyer, and as, as a criminal lawyer, I'm not particularly big up on hate speech offences either. But the, I mean, if you think of it in terms of you know, the officer's first duty, if he doesn't think that what's taking place is a, is a criminal offence, then the, uh, the individual's human rights act, sorry, uh, rights under the European Convention on Human Rights, you know, particularly freedom of expression, if you think in terms of uh, the uh, around protest and the policing of, policing of protests, you know, uh, you know, officers are very, very much aware now in the way that they were a decade ago, that they have an obligation to facilitate those rights of freedom of assembly and freedom of expression. Uh, and that then leads to the question of whether this individual has one. Uh, and therefore, if the individual does have you know, the right to freedom of expression and it isn't limited, because obviously our rights under Article 10 are limited in a number of different ways, and one of those limitations would be uh, upon uh, upon hate speech. I, I think the starting point would be for me, however, though, as I mentioned this earlier, is thinking about this and whether it isn't a crime. Given the broad nature of Section 5 of the Public Order Act, uh, it simply has to be I mean, behaviour which causes or is likely to cause harassment, alarm or distress. And mm. you've got the public who is saying that they are you know, distressed by this and, 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 and find it problematic. 
then I, I would have thought that you would have an officer who at least could be able to have a quiet word. The problem then was what would then happen? Would that escalate with the person who was making these statements, I mean, respond in a way that, you know, insisted they had a right to do so? Uh, and as I said, I don't, I, I, and, and that's the problem. I mean, from a policing perspective, if you just went in and said, no, you've got to shut up and you can't do this, and this person's saying, well, I've got a religious belief that means I think that this is correct and I have a right to say that, that could escalate the matter in another way. I think you would, any officer who did this would have to do with a lot of sensitivity and be very careful about how they did it and, and explain. I, I think it would be a, it would be a, an opportunity to have a quiet word first to do so sensitively rather than just simply saying, you know, you're deceased and must stop doing this. Uh, yeah, it's... I mean, the, 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 the officers who were listening will know this is part of the craft of policing. This is what you have to do. You, know, you can't go in all guns blazing sometimes. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, so I, th I think it's, we haven't really <laughs> clarified very much except to say that I think we all thought that, uh, you know, something had to be done. And we thought that the officers should have, should have a word with this person. And if they continued, then they should treat it as as more serious because... This is a public place and although that we recognise that it's not good to compare across different protected characteristics, we, I did do that as chair and just said, well, if this was a preacher saying that all black people should go to hell, um, then perhaps we would, you know, we wouldn't tolerate that at all. So it needs to be acted upon that because he's in a public place um, and, and this was just unacceptable. And there are limitations. So, yeah, we're saying the most appropriate action is for the police to treat this in a way that says, let's have a word. If he continues, then it's treated more seriously. OK, so I'm going to move on to. Is that OK, Julia? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think, um, I mean, it certainly is a hate, a hate incident and, and the crime bit, actually, you, you know, it's, it's a really interesting one. It's the balance between those those rights, mm. isn't it? And, and, and um you know, it might be one that got tested in court, but yeah, interesting to hear your your thoughts on it. And it's nice to hear you recognising that it's quite tricky. <laughs> yeah, thank you. OK, so scenario two, um, this was about the next door neighbour. You're a member of police staff and your next door neighbour approaches you to ask advice about historic sex offences. Um, what do you do? And on this one, I'm going to bring Lois in first. Sorry, Lois, no warning there. I'm just going <laughs> to... Lois? Clicking on the right button. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. It was just um, to raise the point about discussions with neighbours and anybody else. Children are paramount and safeguarding has to be considered and it isn't the person's choice to make that decision. They should discuss it with a line manager and find out what, what should, how that should move forward because confidentiality is overruled by safeguarding. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we were saying, Julia, that had the had the neighbour just said, "I want to ask your advice about something," the first response of, st of a staff member would, would would be to say, "You do realise that if you tell me something, I'm going to have to report it. If I tell me something around um, that that needs a confidence, yeah." But because she went on to say sex offences, we thought it was immediately reportable. Other comments, anybody? Yeah, can I just clarify something? Because uh, I, I think maybe, I, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, my view initially was because it was historical. Yeah. Um, um, actually, we weren't dealing with a young person. We weren't dealing with somebody underage in terms of, you know, that automatically being yeah. something that we had to report straight away. So my initial view was, you know, we need to... Um, we need to understand and find out if the, the, the alleged perpetrator was still alive and could therefore uh, be in a position to uh, continue with this um, offence. So mm -hmm. obviously, I think if it's safeguarding and it's a child, there's no question around confidentiality. You know, you can't keep that a secret. Uh, you need to tell somebody. But I think my initial thought was because it was historical, actually, either the person wasn't around anymore um, it may have happened when the person was talking to you was a young person, but actually they probably weren't anymore. But I, I, I do take the point of what the other committed members, um, Thank you, Gail. What, what their feelings were. 
Thank you, Gail. I, I think, um, Lois, you were also referring to that even even if it, this was an adult saying this, and it was, because it's 30 years later, um, that it, there may be children that would be at risk, and that's why it was important to report it. Yes, it is, Hello, because I... you don't know who else is involved. Yes, Linda, bring you in, in a minute. Hi. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Hi, Linda. Hi. Um, yeah, because I wasn't involved in this morning's uh, discussions, um, I just want to reiterate what Lois was saying, and although... It may have been historic. Um, again, you've just got to bear in mind the people that the adult now may be involved with. So I would say exactly what Lois said. My first report call would be to speak to my line manager about it. And I wouldn't be investigating anything in terms of getting any more information and just reminding the neighbour really of the sort of, you know, my commitment to the police force and safeguarding. Thank you. Julia, is that helpful at all? Very clear, thank you, yes. And I agree. Well. Right, cool. So I'm going to move on then to the um, dip sampling. Um, and Rich, I think, Rich, you're going to take us through this. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, I can take you through that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, bear with me. I've got, I am linked in on my, uh, my phone with Teams. I'm trying to use my laptop at the same time. Oh, well, thank so. you. I'll, I'll save you from uh, switching my camera on. Um, OK, so have you got the document there in front of you? Yes. To go through? Yeah. So the first one was the um, CO404 of 18. This was corrupt practice, theft and fraud. Um, so th this was around a vehicle that had been recovered and there was allegedly £400 in cash uh, in the sun visor that disappeared once that vehicle had gone into uh, to storage at our request. So... As a result of that, the force policy was amended back in October 2019 to reflect that. So that is in, that is sort of embedded into the document, which sort of uh, talks about any property, evidence, prohibited articles should be removed from the vehicle and booked into our property system prior to that vehicle being left in storage. Because the difficulty with these is once the vehicle is, is gone into storage and left the officers, we lose a certain amount of control over it. So the force policy was amended to reflect that as based on that uh, that particular complaint. So that was that one. Uh, so any questions on that? Am I okay to move on? Uh, move on, Rich. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm only going to pick up the ones where we've sort of made comment on. So yeah. next couple, of, yeah, we've noted the comments on that one. Next one to talk about is the um, patrol resolution sergeant and uh, sort of remark and get lots of calls for general advice and whether this is recorded and how this features into um, any uh, feedback or or individual learning. So um, our sort of take on this is that as a sergeant or supervisor, you you often do get asked questions about many different things, operational or or likewise. So so sergeants and supervisors are often given advice out and it doesn't necessarily mean that's learning that needs to sort of flow into the organisation. But the expectation is if if there is an incident where there is some significant learning, that should that should get flagged as, as learning for the force. And we've got it the, the get it right first time meeting where we do coordinate the high level learning that we, we sort of identify across the force to disseminate that just mm -hmm. to make sure that we are um, continuing to improve and continue to operate at the, at, um, at the, at the sort of best practice. So that for us was just sort of your general sort of run of the mill advice that you'd expect a sergeant to be given and that they'll be doing this numerous times during the shift because that, that's the whole point of the, their yeah. role as a sergeant. They are there to, to advise. So it's kind of at the lower level where we wouldn't expect that to be fed back into the force so that that one hang on rich um i've got yeah. lynn just wanting to make to say okay. something uh yes i was just um thinking around the the wider issues there for instance in the charitable sector the sort of knowledge of an experienced employee would be seen as an asset of the organization and captured and as you're saying you are able to capture that as a legacy um uh, through the process that you just described, but that's going to become even more important, I would suggest, given that a lot of your older officers are going to be retiring in the next uh, five years, which you mentioned, was mentioned earlier in another paper. And so capturing unrecorded knowledge, as it were, and experience, mm. looking at that uh, in a lot of detail will be very, very important when 50% of the force are going to have less than five years experience. So I, I take your point that in this in, in, 
uh, instance, there wasn't any, you know, wider knowledge to, to feed back. But I'm just thinking that this is going to become an important issue going forward, that there are going to be less people to ask who will know the answers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's all very well sort of doing training and doing that sort of front-ended input, but I think it's the practical application of that. It's the experience, it's the knowledge of, of being a police officer and, and the years of experience and what that tells you. And I think that's absolutely invaluable. So absolutely, it, it, it's, it's a really, really valid point. And it's just, yeah, how, how do we capture that? Obviously, we need experience at, at the front end in order to, for the new recruits coming through to develop off the back of that develop their own experience so um we, we do through the force anyway then um, we uh, uh, training the, obviously the training priorities panel is there to identify specific training needs for officers again it's just to keep us operating at the forefront of best practice and making sure that good practice national best practice um is and, appro and approved professional practice is disseminated through the teams just to make sure that we are operating at the forefront. So, yeah, it's a really valid point. I think it's something that we just need to continue okay. to to monitor, making sure that we do capture feedback and we do capture learning and it is fed back to the teams that need it. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Just moving through. Sorry, is there any more questions? No, before go, we move on? go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Rich. So the next one was CO4 of 18. This was investigation um, in relation to custody and uh, some um, requests for medication. And the question was, if the healthcare uh, is not available, should policy allow GP contact regarding the medication? Um, we, we've got a, a, um, a contract with, with Mighty, which is um, regularly monitored, particularly around their performance. And currently their performance is at 98% compliant. So this was actually sort of fed back into the Chief of Specs for Criminal Justice to say, OK, are we, are we OK with this? Are we, are we sure we've got the safeguards in place? So they were absolutely satisfied. No further action was, was required with this. But we do know that detainees do have uh, very quick access to healthcare professionals and if necessary we will take them down to the Royal Infirmary as well so it, it's it's a fairly sort of robust system in terms of yes we've got the mighty contract we've got healthcare professionals that, that are on hand in order to to look after treat assess review uh, detainees but there's also the 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 option if necessary they can get immediate um, treatment through EMAS or uh, is actually sort of taken down to the Royal Infirmary so on this particular one, having reviewed it by the Chief Inspector, we didn't think there was any further intervention required. So unless there's any further questions, I'll just move through to the next move, one. Move on, Rich. Um, so the next one was an interesting one, CM31 of 19. This was around the detainee request for the toilet and whether that refusal may have exacerbated the behaviour of that person and an issue around the no warning about the captor spray being used. So um, I, I did the final assessment on this particular incident and it is a real interesting one because the, the male was extremely violent, extremely threatening. He was drunk. I think there was some drugs involved as well. So right from the moment he was arrested, he was exhibiting extreme violence in the back of the, um, the, the transit van that conveyed him. He was um, banging his head. Uh, on the cage which split his head it wasn't just sort of tapping it was it was full-on headbutt to the cage which then split his head he, that so they've diverted to the royal infirmary and having watched two hours of body worn video the, the behavior was just off the off the scale he he was unbelievably violent and threatening to officers it wasn't just every now and now and again it was consistent all the way through so the officers were absolutely exhausted off after the end of this and they were I think actually it was a really, really difficult incident to manage and um, it has been taken to, to the Royal. It would continue to be threatening and there was a real risk for this individual that it was quite manipulative as well. So they had to make a decision here whether actually allowing him to use the toilet would have increased the risk and they believe that to be the case. We've had incidents previously where detainees have asked to go to the toilet deliberately to try and escape. We've had a couple of incidents where they've managed to escape. One recently where they've actually jumped out of a window and broken the leg, uh, which we've then had to refer to the IOPC due to the injury. So there is some real risk around this. And, and we do know that people will use it as an opportunity to either 
uh, escape or, or cause injury to others. So the, 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 the kind of the level of violence offered by this individual was, was extremely high. And that also sort of leads me on to the, the use of the captor. Um, so we, we or I deemed that to be an acceptable use of force. There was no um, warning prior to that. The warning is only there for officers to get them out of the way so they don't become contaminated by it. But when, when we've looked at it for the whole sort of two hour interaction, it was more than justified because um, the, the guy was clearly starting to show violence again once he came out of the hospital. So there was almost going to be a repeat of that back into the van, injury back to the Royal. So the actual spray worked really well because it did distract him to the point where they get him into the back of the van and get him back to Kim Lane without incident. And you can see the officer continually trying to talk to this chap and, and communicate with him and that managed to actually avoid any further incidents. So it, it was a really tricky incident, but uh, like I say, from my knowledge, having, having done the final assessment on that, that uh, the officers did act correctly. But obviously, we note the, the sort of question around the use of the toilet. So, if there's, is there any more questions on that particular is that, incident? Is that um, okay with everybody on the committee? Yes, Rich. Thank you. Yeah. Move on. Okay. Next one. There's not much of an update on it. I don't know why, but I can, I can give you some narrative around this. This was clarity around the child's safety in the vehicle is unclear. So again, have reviewed this, that there is there is um, legislation under the Road Traffic Act uh, under the seatbelt regulation schedule two. I know that because I've read it. I don't I don't know that off pat. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there, there is something in there where if there's an unplanned journey and it's a short distance for any child over the age of three, they can be taken in the vehicle unsecured. And looking at this, I think due to the dynamics of the incident, the people involved, that the children did need to be moved a short distance. So the officers were very aware of the safety and they were adhering to the Road Traffic Act. So uh, there's no particular issues around that one. Thank you, Rich. I, I wonder that, why that the, really the comment got... the the Road Traffic yeah. Act, that one. OK. <laughs> uh, next one. Uh, yeah, that comment's noted. Thank you. So and next two as well. So go down to CO4519. This was neglect of duty. Uh, this is around um, four allegations made, and in particular um, around the the lack of clarification um, that the person had been informed that they were actually under arrest. So, on review, th this relates to paragraph three three code G of PACE, which obviously governs a significant amount of what we do. Um, so somebody should be informed of their arrest immediately and obviously given the caution. There is a caveat within that and a, a delay can be justified due to the condition or behaviour of the individual, i.e. if they're extremely drunk or intoxicated through drink or drugs, extremely violent, I think it would be difficult um, to try and sort of give the, or, or sort of provide the caution and, and say the words of arrest, particularly if, you, if you're sort of having to sort of um, try and restrain them. So that that there is a caveat in, in pace to, to allow a delay to to give the words of arrest and caution and on this occasion we didn't think there was there was the reasonable um there was any reasonable justification for the delay so the judgment was that the officer would be given words of advice around uh, code g of pace to make sure that if you do um arrest you've got to say the words and you've got to caution and there is only one real caveat to that is if the condition of the detainee would make that unreasonable so that was that one. So unless, unless there's any questions, I can move on from that one. Yes, Rich, move on. OK, yeah. Um, next one is CO31618. This is in relation to a piece. So this one is an interesting one. So a couple of what could be um, terms quite serious allegations around um, computer misuse, accessing information on the system in relation to an individual and using that uh, inappropriately, i.e. by disclosing that to third parties. Um, so. Obviously, that was fully investigated as, as a misconduct matter. Uh, so in relation to allegation two, there was actually no evidence that the PCSO had accessed the complainant's records. And we were able to do that by reviewing their access to the IT system so we can see exactly what they're looking at. So it, it, it is relatively easy for us to identify if somebody is unnecessarily accessing systems they shouldn't be. And we've had... Um, a number of misconduct investigations and people have lost their jobs as a direct result of them accessing systems they shouldn't do because because of the systems that we've got we can very easily see if somebody's accessing something they shouldn't be and it all comes back to the policing purpose if you've not got a policing purpose 
you should not be accessing that system. So we were satisfied absolutely that there was no access to the complainants records which then been uh, disclosed. So allegation two, there was no no evidence. Allegation one, this is around um, that the the individual had accessed a system to check on an RTC. However, they had actually been involved in that incident. They were off duty, but um, they they'd actually come across it and actually stopped to help. So they'd gone onto the storm incident system just to make sure everybody was OK and and, and uh, they've been dealt with so technically there was no policing purpose and that's why we gave words of advice so there was it never reached the, the, the threshold for misconduct so this this was a learning opportunity there was no one with disclosure and there was a connection to the incident because they'd actually dealt with it um, so our, our view was it had not reached the threshold for misconduct but words of advice quite rightly were given just remind them that a policing purpose is required yeah. to access a particular system um, so unless there's any questions, I can move on. I think that was, that was, oh, there's one more. Yeah, there's one more. Go yeah, ahead. One yeah, more. go ahead, Rich. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this one is in relation to a, it's quite a distressing incident, this one. It's a 15-year-old that was reporting a rape um, and there was sort of some delay with regard to, identify, well, we, we knew who the offender was, but there was a delay in actually ident identifying where they were and arresting them. And when we actually did get to the address, we found that they'd, that they'd committed suicide. So obviously there was some concern about why why did it take so long to get to the address? So on review, um, we, we found that actually the, the mother and father were estranged and had been for some time due to domestic abuse issues. And, we, and the child didn't know the address. And when mother dropped her off or picked her up, it's from the local corner shop. So there wasn't a like, and, and I think this mail had moved several times. There wasn't like, there wasn't that sort of immediate opportunity to to go to the address to find him, to arrest him. And it did take uh, 24 hours by using other systems such as Experian. But uh, we, we'd identified that um, the, the the death was not linked to, to the delay in finding him. Uh, and we did um, make a decision not to refer that to the IOPC because we were satisfied that the officers had done absolutely everything they could to locate the, the suspect at the earliest possible opportunity. It was just unfortunate he had um, killed himself because I think he, he knew that it was being reported to us and obviously made, made a decision to, to end it at that, that point. So we were satisfied there was no further action on that one. So, so I think that that covers off Thank all you. of the, um, the the dip sample. So happy to take any questions in respect of those. Thank you, colleagues. Any any further follow up for Rich? Rich, I think we're all satisfied. Thank you very yeah. much for that. No, no problem. Um, I'm, I'm mindful I came into this late, and I don't know whether you wanted me to do anything around those social media paper or whether you've, you've run out of time for that now. I'll I leave think that we won't, Rich, yeah, because yeah. Um, we've got 10 minutes to go and I've got one yeah. more item. Um, OK. So I think um, I think we're all right with that. Thank you very much, though, yeah. for that offer. Yeah. OK, no problem. OK. Um, so the final item on the agenda is the COVID paper. Julia? So, um, so I did actually write this paper as well, and, and um, so having been sort of the fourth lead for COVID um, for, for most of the period, although it started off with, with one of our other ACCs, Kerry, um, who's probably done all of the, the hard work. Um, just before, before I start, since I've written this paper, just so you know, there is an Optala Independent Ethics Committee that is going to be looking at sort of response to Optala, so COVID is called Optala. Optala in policing. I, don't know, I think it's just policing, um, or it might be the government. Um, so from the national sort of infrastructure downwards, there's this thing called o Operation Tala. Oh, um, okay. And there is an independent ethics committee that's going to be chaired by the Bishop of Manchester. So I didn't know if that was if anybody from mm. our ethics committee might want to make any contact around that and have yeah. any. Um, and if there's further, you know, if there's discussions you wanted outside of here, just in relation to our response to it, then and, and how we've managed, then um, you know, I'd be really happy to have any any wider conversation with you. But I mean, really, the, the report that I've written has has outlined um, has outlined our approach. I mean, it's been just quite a cathartic kind of. Gosh, this has been tricky. It's been really so unprecedented. I know not just for policing, but for everybody. Um, and I've sort of just tried to articulate what I think some of the key challenges for us have been 
Um, some of those key challenges, just to pick out a couple of interesting bits um, for, for this sort of this, this committee. Um, public expectations of us. So obviously the law changing very quickly in terms of what you know what you're allowed to do. You know, suddenly you're not allowed out of your house more than once a day. And what is the public expectation of policing in, in all of that as a response? And um, one of the things, and I, I can't bring it back to you now, but at a later date, we certainly can do. We, we, we did, through that neighbourhood link work, we did survey some of our communities to say, to get a bit of a view about what do you think, you know, how important do you think it is for us to be, to be policing COVID? Um, so you'll have seen very different responses by police forces nationally, um, very different, you know, some real criticism for police forces. And, and when yeah, we did this yeah. survey of communities, it was clear that, um, and, and I, I say again, we're not reaching all of our hard to reach people here. I completely accept that. But the ones that we could reach, there was quite a divide. You know, some people felt we shouldn't be policing it. Some people felt we should and others didn't really know. Um, it was almost a third. It, it was slightly more people felt we shouldn't be prioritising COVID over other things. This is the first time in my in my policing service that a public health emergency has directly led to you know any enforcement responsibilities for us so well, I think there have been some real challenges for us along the way just around how we've responded I'm massively you know I, I think we've responded really really well locally I, I, I would say that um, we're, we're obviously still in that response stage and moving now into um, into what restriction of uh, lifting restrictions, opening of um, opening of um, new, you know, licensed premises and, and, and what have, have you going forward. Um, all sorts of ethical issues actually associated with that, you know. So, so the management of you mm. know the, the, the balancing of, of commercial needs with society needs, with law enforcement needs. Frankly, if if the pubs and clubs never opened again, it would be good for us because <laughs> um, we've had. And it would be good for the hospitals because, um, you know, because attendance is down and we've not had to respond to people drunk fighting in the city, you know, on a Friday, Saturday night. And sexual offences are massively down. Serious sexual offences are massively down, as are serious violent offences. You know, but you can't. In fact, the reason for that is because people haven't been going out and getting drunk and and and, um, and and fighting. But we can't lock people in the house. You know, ethical dilemma. Should we lock people up all day? Um, in their house we probably can't can we so um so i've not the paper really is more informative than than asking you to for any i think there are some ethical issues within our response to covid that we've had to deal with as we've gone along the way um we are now looking you'll be you'll be aware of, of the protest issue so the issue around protest and the black Lives matters issue and how that conflicts with some of the um some of the legislation around COVID. So that presents us with a challenge that we've had to deal with. I'd be really happy at a later date to bring that back to this um, group, just for mm -hmm. you to review how we've responded, I think, to, um, you know, the, the COVID restrictions say you can't have gatherings. We've, we've then, well, have we facilitated lawful gatherings? Have we, we've been there, you know, where we've had the Black Lives Matters, that there is a, you know, we've, we've, we've had to balance. There's been a lot of balancing to be done and it'd be interesting to get a perspective at, at, a, at, a, at another time on how we've done that. Um, and sorry, I'll leave it open for, for anybody to ask any questions around. I know Stephen you've got, and others have got their hands up, so I'll, I'll be quiet. Yes, um, okay, so uh, I don't know who was first, so I'll go to Gail first and then, because she's a new member of the committee, <laughs> and, <I'll go> to, <laughs> and then I'll go to Stephen. Yeah, it was just a really, really quick one on your last point about the, the protests and the demonstrations. So uh, from a personal perspective, because I actually went on one of the demonstrations and I thought the police presence was uh, very sensitive. Um, there was a presence, but it wasn't at all threatening. It was quite reassuring. And nobody that I've spoken to from uh, my community felt that it was... Um, you know, in any way uh, kind of disproportionate. So I just wanted to say congratulations. Thank you. Stephen. Yeah, just uh, unmute myself, nearly forgot there. Uh, I, I, you know, a few wider points on, on, on the policing of COVID, which can come afterwards. But first, 
on the, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, in, in, in the COVID context. I mean, if that, you know, we've obviously got a very packed agenda, but if we could come back, I think that would be really interesting. I, mean, I, I have seen from human rights lawyers and, and, and the regulations around COVID, obviously the catch-all regulation is around being out with a reasonable excuse. And in particular, uh, when the regulations changed to allow you know, some form of gathering, there were questions about what a gathering means and whether there's some form of intent or mens rea that would go with that and how that would fit with one's right to protest. Uh, and that's obviously a very tricky you know, legal issue that one would have to unpack. So yeah, it, 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 I, think, I think you're right as a force to think about you know, that balance between facilitating individuals' right to protest, particularly in an important right in, in the context, uh, against those regulations. So, but yeah, if we could come back to that, I think I, I would really enjoy the discussion around that, uh, if I had some time to think about it. In relation to policing of COVID generally, I, I, I wasn't sure whether to raise this, but actually, I, I'd, I'd like—I mean, I'd, I'd like your and, and other officers' opinion on, on on if they thought about this, because one of the things I've been thinking throughout and thinking about this from a policing perspective is, is one of the discussions we've, what one of the themes that we have in discussions in this meeting is you know, the role and the function of the police, and are they restricted to you know, policing crime? And then if they are restricted to policing crime, how do we define crime? Because obviously one of the things around the regulations and the offence that was created is that the individuals who might breach that offence are not directly causing harm in the same way that you would with an assault. What you're doing is you're creating the risk of increased infection, which mm -hmm. then has the risk that others may catch the disease and has the risk that some of them will be hospitalised, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very remote risk. Uh, and I'm not saying you were wrong to police it, but it was it was interesting. It, it, it'll be interesting in your perspective. Of, did you, as a force, think about that? Did you think how far is this within our remit, or did you just accept that this is what we have to do? You know, I think that would be an important point. And then I think it's a sub question of that. I was thinking then about well, what did you do? What did you do with those reports that you got from members of the public who, who were saying my neighbour has breached the regulations because they've been out for a run twice today. You know, did, did you action those? If you did mm -hmm. action, the threshold, what sort of questions were you were addressing? You know, what investigative process did you have at all? Uh, and I think, again, we might not be able to do this now, but later down the line when, when looking back, I think it would be, again, useful from an ethical perspective to start thinking and, and address those wider questions as well. Those, sorry, those specific questions alongside that wider question of what your role and function is. Okay. <laughs> She's got my husband asking if she should go shopping. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go shopping. Go shopping, Julia. It's fine. <laughs> After you've answered this question. Um, no, wait, I'm not going. Um, <laughs> oh, so, just before you come in, Julia, Gail, uh, can I just check? Did you have another question? Because your hand is still up. No, no, sorry. Okay. No, I haven't. That's okay. All right. Sorry, Julia. Go ahead. Um, so j just in response to those questions, it, it, it was... Um, so the first one in terms of what, what we felt, so, so I think the messaging that we put out was very clearly around this is, you know, we have to think differently. This isn't like normal policing. And there was an actual, um, you know, thought process to say that this isn't like normal policing. This is this mm. is a public health emergency. And so we had a gold strategy, which then fe feeds into the tactical delivery. But the gold strategy is all about this is this is. And so I, I've said I've never dealt with anything like this in my service. You know, our, our, our number one priority was to stop the spread of the, the coronavirus. You know, that, that so, so our, our first priority was a public health priority and still is, by the way, rather than a policing priority. So so by communicating that to officers quite, quite clearly, I think um, that probably helped in terms of, you know, that, that they knew that if they were going out and, and having reports, that, that that was the reason that we were acting. You know, it wasn't about antisocial behaviour or anything like that. It was about the public health thing. But we were really clear and quite quite soon, um, I mean, we had this approach locally and, and it was quite soon confirmed nationally around this 4E approach. So where, where and again, the sort of role of policing really is quite fundamental in this. And, 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 and my... Um, you know, my confidence in public confidence and that we police by consent was really important because, 
you know, we weren't looking to enforce in the first instance. We were looking to engage with the public and explain and enforcement very much being the last the last sort of um, resort so that people would go out and have conversations with people and, and, and try to encourage them to, to do as they were told before we got to an enforcement element. So so that's the approach we took. And, and I think that, you know, there was a, a you know, a, a change in officers mindset when they're going out to deal with that and I, I think I think we've probably struck the balance about right here so in terms of enforcement with fixed penalty notices we're sort of midway you know in the middle average of, of nationally in terms of how we've how we've allocated them. Um, to answer your question Stephen about the types of reports that then came in so again we, we did one of our other objectives so we set our strategic objectives which were in the document and one of them was around you know, sort of dealing with public concern and recognising that the public were concerned about things that, you know, normally um, wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't respond to as a priority. So we changed our grading policy and dealt with things that, um, so if, and particularly really, so what we were saying is, if, if we think people are meeting in a public place, we're going to deal with that as more of a priority. If somebody's gone round somebody's house, we might end up getting to it, but it isn't going to be a priority incident for us. But we do need to respond, and particularly if we're getting repeat calls to somebody's address. So we changed our grading policy to give call handlers the um, some guidance around how 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 to respond to calls from members of the public about their neighbours having visitors, which we've had many many thousands of, particularly when the weather was good. We've had thousands and thousands of reports from the public about people breaching COVID rules. Thank you, Julia. Um, I just wanted to add, oh, I've got Rich, I think, wants to come in as well. Rich, did you want to come in? No. Yeah, just very quickly. Um, yeah. we, we've only had 28 COVID-19 related complaints that come in from late March, which I think is a really low number, especially when you look at some other forces, particularly Derbyshire, because I think they were uh, headline news for some of their um, approach. So I think that is reflective of, of how we've been um, seen by the public of LLR and the way we've responded to it. So I think actually it's something that we should be sort of pleased with because of the numbers that are so low, given the thousands of calls that have been coming in. But I just thought it was an important point to raise that actually really limited number of COVID-related complaints. So it's just something I just wanted to, I think was, was helpful for the conversation. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, Stephen, you had a hand up again? Yeah, yeah, that's, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've yeah, got it up. I'll, I'll take it down again now because I'll turn it back up. Yeah, just, just to come back, well, I'll come back to Rich's point, and we've discussed this before when talking about complaints. You know, a low number of complaints doesn't mean a low rate of satisfaction. Uh, it a lot depends on on whether there's confidence in the complaint system. But I think for something as as fundamental as this, I, I think it, you know it does tell us something. I, I, I would agree with that. I just want to come back really on on Judy's point there in terms of, and I think this could be interesting going forward as well. Because obviously one of the things we were all thinking about was what is our new normality going to be like uh, when all this dies down. You, do you think that this is going to therefore change officers' frontline ability? Now, now, we all know that a good officer on the street as part of the craft of policing you know, should start with discussion, you know, if at all possible, should start with negotiation and, and do that. You, having to do that, in, but being forced to do that because the message was clearly this is public health rather than crime, do you think that and I know officers do this all the time in other contexts, do you think it's going to change the way that your officers on the ground are going to approach their job in, in the next stage? Once life gets back to normal, do you think that's going to lead to a slight culture shift in, in, in many ways? I know it's a really hard question, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. I, I don't know is the honest answer. I mean, I, I would, you know, I would like to think that people are already take a sort of proportionate and graduated approach to any, to any incident, but I'm, you know, recognise that that won't be the case in every case. Um, I don't know. Well, I, well, I don't know, Stephen. I think we'll have to sort of wait and sit, wait and see. I think I think I, I am really impressed with how officers responded with great mm. flexibility. Um, you know, bearing in mind that they're probably, you know, out of everybody. So a load of us have, have worked from, you know, we, we, we immediately sort of went and worked from home and and split the teams and work from the office. You know, these are people we're asking to go out every day and still respond to all of these incidents. Yes. yes. Um, 
So I, I think they've shown great flexibility in the way they've responded. But I, I, it will be an, it will be an interesting one just to see whether we do notice any difference. Well, I, I, I wonder then, because obviously one of the things we consistently talk about is you know, learning opportunities. I wonder if this is an opportunity for the force to actually yeah. try and, and, and use this shift <clears throat> to reinforce that message. As you quite rightly said, Judy, of what you think good policing looks like. I mean, use this as an opportunity to say to those frontline officers, you know, what you've been doing is great and we'd like this to continue. We'd like yeah. that approach to be central to all of the work that you do, with it all possible. I mean, uh, Rich obviously earlier was giving the example of you know, that person who was arrested and detained who, you know, who was acting in a way that you can't take that in a much more reasoned, proportionate response. But it, you know, in lots of circumstances, I mean, that, that is the art and the craft of policing. And, yeah, I think there could be an opportunity here. Mm. OK, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, colleagues. Um, yes. As we are now at seven okay. minutes past four, I've got I've got Linda. Just a minute, Linda. Um, I just wanted to, to try and bring this to a close as, as soon as we can on this paper. I did want to just commend the force, though. I really liked the, the thinking around the strategic aim and the objectives, that it, it wasn't just, you know, we've got to police this. It was about preserving life and keeping people safe, both in the force and in the public. So I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for that. Linda, um, yeah, last point. Oh, you just grabbed my limelight there, Karen, because I was just going <laughs> to echo that. Uh, oh, okay. I just wanted to commend uh, the police force in how they have worked. They've been very resilient and um, we've not really had anything in terms of the media of, towards any complaints by the police of having to go out and deal front line with no protective equipment as such. I know it's been a discussion um, amongst a lot of people that I work with how well the police have done. You know, some police have had to actually move out of their homes to protect the public. Um, so really, I just wanted to commend sort of the police for what they have done. Yeah. But it would really be interesting to come back to this and look at the opportunities in terms of flexibility and the way that the police are going to work in the future. Because I do think out of this pandemic, working with sort of frontline staff myself, it has opened some positive opportunities and different ways of working. Um, so I'll be interested to um, probably come back to this at a later date. And that's all I had to say. So if I've run Thank over you, Linda. one minute, I'm sorry. Thank you, Linda. You're um, so I think that is the end of the meeting. I want to say thank you so much to the police to force, the police people here, the officers, the staff, for everything that you're doing to keep the community safe. Thank you to the committee. Thank you to Willie for joining us. And um, yeah, stay safe. Have a lovely weekend. I have one more Zoom call to do today <laughs> and then I can go for a weekend. Um, yeah, and I hope to see you all very, very soon. We'll try and arrange a, another meeting. We failed hopelessly to get a pre-meeting in the week sometime, uh, partly my fault. So, um, but colleagues, thank you and stay thank safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very you. Very bye, much. everyone. Bye, bye. 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 Thanks, Stephen, for setting it up.